I Hear Motion is the name of a new book, and we have its author, Jane Gasso, at Noise11.com. Welcome, Jane. Thank you, Paul. I Hear Motion. Well, you know, that's a pretty popular song title, isn't it? And a great title for the book because, you know, that was uh, one of the major hits of the early 80s, and it really does summarise basically what we're about to devour when we go through the pages of the I Hear Motion book. I thought so. I thought it was the perfect title for the book because it, it it says exactly what what's inside the book. It was either that or change in mood because there really was a change in mood. Of course, the kids in the kitchen hit from 83, but there really was a change in mood, I felt, in the Australian Guard at that time, uh, certainly on Countdown and um, and in the Australian music stratosphere. So uh, I'm very happy with I Hear Motion. I'm sure Sean and uh, Andrew from the models are as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, the book specifically targets the 80s period, which r- really uh, was a definitive point in Australian music from 1980 to 1989 before we got the sea change when we got to the early 1990s. Um, but, you know, that... 1980 to 1989 period actually had a sound of its own, didn't it? Mm. And there were so many musical changes in that in that ten years. Like it's crazy, you know. If you think about how the synth pop, early synth pop era of the decade, you know, where bands were trying to emulate Human League and Spandau Ballet and Duran Duran, and then you get to the end of the decade, and that's kind of where Kylie and Jason and that Stock Aiken and Waterman sound was really relevant and pre- prevalent. Uh, you know, Melissa Counts and all those kind of Polish Colette pop hits and, you know, bands like Pseudo Echo that started out as synth pop bands were were now dressed in denim with long hair, releasing rock records, trying to sound like Bon Jovi. So there really was such a rapid shift in that musical sound. And we were introduced to a whole lot of new music uh, out of Australia as well, Machinations, Wawani, Real Life, Kids in the Kitchen, Do Re Mi, Coup d'Etat, Eurogliders, Boom Crash Opera, uh, Max Q, all came over that period of time. They did, yeah. yeah. We can't even look yeah. at the last 10 years in Australian music and gather up that many names. Yeah, certainly that that had the longevity and the household name status that these bands had because, you know, we go back to a time when, what, there were five channels in most metropolitan cities, uh, Countdown ruled, and that was the way we found out about our new music as well as, you know, commercial radio. But if it was on Countdown, it was inevitable that commercial radio would pick up those songs. And these bands had, you know, three, four, five hits you know, uh, in that time, and they re- those songs really have become the soundtrack to our lives. You know, I think it's so, and, and these songs have been forgotten. And I really wanted to revisit so many of those great songs. I mean, you look at you look at the incredible output the Eurogliders had in that classic lineup. You know, um, you know, which featured Amanda Vincent on keyboards, for example. You know, um, from from this island, for and and. And the Groove uh, record, you know, so many great songs. Machinations, so many great songs. You know, okay, admittedly, Venetians, maybe three or four, not so remembered, but they deserve to be remembered. So much for love. What an absolute opus produced by Mark Opitz and absolutely packs a punch. It certainly was. Kate Sobrano in the book says the 80s were so good because you could uh, experiment without any fear of consequence and that's what we did. That really does sum it up. There was a lot of experimentation that really paid off and they actually created a template for what was to come. Yeah, and I think I'm talking have been so underrated in music Australian musical history because they were the first funk band, really, you know, those those Essendon Airport members came across and grabbed a very young Kate and, and a young Zan and created something so beautiful with bare witness that no one else was doing it. You know, they again they were looking to overseas, but they were giving it their own their own shape and their own sound. Um and that that record from start to finish really is remarkable. And it's yeah, I, I just felt, yeah, that a lot so many of these bands deserved a second look in. Uh, Jenny Morris uh, says, as a quote in the book, the Australian scene came of age in the 80s. Um, You know, that's probably 
a bit of a stretch. I mean, you know, if we go back to the late seventies, even the mid seventies, with you know uh, the uh, the Angels, ACDC, Midnight Oil, Cultures, all all oh, of that beginning. Absolutely, absolutely. But by the same token, I understand what she means. You know, it, it as as Kate kind of indicated, it was a DIY period. We'd kind of veered away from that that meat and potatoes rock that those bands that you mentioned in the seventies did so well. And suddenly, you know, the floodgates were opened for a Do-Re-Mi to appear or a QED to appear. Do you know what I mean? Maybe they wouldn't have had any kind of legs or longevity in the 70s if they came out because that just wasn't the flavour of the month. It was all about those guitars and drums, you know, that rock sound the be- that was playing in the beer barns. You know, real life talk about going into those beer barns supporting the Angels and almost getting beaten up but winning the crowd by the end of it. I think in the uh, in the late 70s we had Countdown and it, conformed us. Uh, it, it it drove us down a funnel. So everyone was hearing the same thing at the same time. Uh, mm. When we got to the early 80s, two things happened. Uh, first one was that you had the start of FM radio, commercial FM radio in Australia, and that uh, put a, a, a different uh, taste of music onto the Australian airwaves. Uh, you also had uh, two double J become uh, triple J and go from a Sydney AM radio station to a national FM network, and that created uh, even more diversity. So mm. if we go if we go back to pre FM, where basically you had three XY in Melbourne, two SM in Sydney, four IP in Brisbane, uh, everyone was basically hearing the same thing uh, with a countdown layer over the top of that, and then suddenly. Yeah. All of this new music that uh, just wouldn't have hit the AM airwaves was suddenly being uh, uh, consumed on the radio, which was just fantastic. Is that part of the reason we saw this evolution of Australian music in the beginning of the 80s? Oh, oh, undoubtedly. But also I think technological advances had come become so prevalent because you know, as I said, in the early 80s, you know, the synthesizer was king. You know, that that, that kind of started out in the 70s in disco, but then was being, was being uh, I guess, utilised by those British bands I mentioned, Human League and, and, and you know, Heaven 17 and Spandau Ballet and, and early Duran Duran. And, and Australian bands were emulating, you know, Andrew Duffield talks about Michael Gadinsky bringing over from, from the UK one of the very early prototype synthesizers, which... Andrew just fell in love with and thereby starts to write a melody not unlike Stevie Wonder's superstition called Gag Bag, which then evolves into I Hear Motion. I mean, there were so many of those synthesizer sounds which Pseudo Echo were taking up, you know, with their autumnal park record. You know, they started out as a band with two synthesizers. This was also important and I think also important a bit later on in the decade was the uh, the introduction of MTV, who needed music videos, and so you know, count you know us Australian bands had always had the great video thanks to Countdown and Sounds, Night Moves, etc. So when MTV came, you know we we had enough music videos to to give them, and um, again you know providing content which was great. Tell me about the curation of the I Hear Motion book because we have the Mental Pseudo Echo Eurogliders. Kate Sobrano with I'm Talking, uh, Boom Crash Opera. That's the more successful commercial end of the Australian music in the 80s. But you also dig deep into Bear Garden, into Geisha, Coup d'etat, Electric Pandas. Uh, and, you know, you're, you're telling a, a much more broader story uh, about what the Australian music industry was in the early 1980s other than what we saw on a chart. These bands that you mentioned, their stories hadn't really been told before. I mean, we know about the giants of the scene. We know about the cold chisel story. We know about Midnight Oil. You know, we know about Crowded House. You know, those stories have been told ad ad infinitum, right? But I really felt that these bands that were the soundtrack certainly to my life, I didn't know a lot about these bands and where they went and why they didn't transcend the 90s, why they couldn't couldn't translate into the 1990s. I mean, of course, yes, grunge was prevalent and alternative music took over and became the the mainstream in the 90s. But I really wanted to know what happened to these bands because I adored these bands. I absolutely adored them, everyone that you mentioned. So for me it was about uh, tracking these bands down and finding out about their stories. But I think the catalyst really, Paul, was 
the sad, untimely death of Paul Gray from Wawane mm. uh, back in, I think it was 2019. And I, when he passed away, I went looking for interviews uh, with Wawane from the 80s. Not a lot of stuff out there, not a lot. Uh, so I tracked down Steve Williams and I got him to tell me the Wawane story, which absolutely blew me away. I mean, that is an incredible story about if you want the 80s encapsulated in one story, the Wawane chapter's got everything, you know, trying to crack America, almost breaking America, upsetting the the head of the American record label, being sent away packing, you know, having Wham's manager as your own manager, um, you know, uh, and, and, a, and a sad, untimely death. Um, so it was really the it was really Wawane that kind of kicked everything off and then from there I went to real life, which, again, you know, people forget how big Send Me an Angel was globally and how successful that song has been for this one band whose lead singer comes from Footscray and went to Footscray High, you know. And, and, and David Steary is still touring, although I do think he announced his retirement recently, but was still touring up until recently to Germany uh, where that song is like an anthem to them, you know. So I just I just believed and felt that these stories hadn't been told and deserved to, ha- deserved to be told. They, did, they needed a platform. There's a uh, wise old man uh, by the name of Gavin Wood who uh, I quote from your book. Uh, it mm-hmm. was a very fertile time for live bands who were working six nights a week and sometimes playing over 300 shows a year. You know, just think of that compared to now. You know, we see bands that they put out their tour announcement. It's got six dates on it. It goes over a six-week period, and then they don't do anything for another year. Mm-hmm. It was a completely different time then. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were working hard. I mean, you were you were, you were were at the cold face. You were probably at half of those gigs, you know, seven nights a week. I mean, that was the thing. You could go out seven nights a week and see see incredible music, you know, uh, high standard of bands, most of who have been on Countdown or were being played on 3XY. I mean, you know, some bands talk about doing three shows a day, you know, a, a matinee show, an early evening show, and then, you know, late night at Bell Street Rock at midnight, you know, crazy. Mm. Lee Simon says in the book, uh, I think this book will have a lot of people reassessing who they consider to have been seminal in the development and influence of Australian music. Uh, You know, I think he's right there. There's a a perception that Australian music is ACDC, NXS, you know, uh, Olivia Newton-John. You're digging a lot deeper down into really giving the DNA of uh, what Australian music was in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. You know, and... Each band that I have listed, each had, you know, I say the pop stars had personalities, you know. You knew that Brian Mannix was a cheeky little bogan, you know, from Broad Meadows, you know, and you loved and accepted him or you didn't, you know, it was very polarising. You know, Scott Kahn was almost like the cool Simon Le Bon lead singer. You know, Brian Cannon, so handsome, you know, with his haircuts. Um, uh, you know, Grace Knight, such a chameleon, you know, she she appeared differently in every music video. Uh, you know, the beautiful Sean Kelly almost shouting um, and, and, the you know, the when he teamed up with James Freud. I mean, such a such a strong, uh, I guess, nucleus of that band. Stephen, Stephen Paul from Wawane, you know, the blonde and the, the brunette, you know. Um, I, I, you know, each band I loved and adored differently because each one was different. You know, it's none of this cookie cutter stuff. I mean, I find now, you know, you look at the charts and there's a there's a ton of females. Nothing wrong with females on charts. Absolutely love that. But I can't tell them apart. I don't know which which female sings which song. You know, I know that every generation says that about the charts. I, I, I get it. But they, each band in the 80s for me was different, absolutely different and di- differentiated by their music. And that was so wonderful. I think you're describing how the music industry works these days as opposed to every female sounding the same. Yeah. Uh, they've yeah, got look, the same look, songwriters you know, behind I think, them. I think you have to sound like everybody else now to get a record deal. But I think then the, the, the idea was not to sound like everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. There was something that I learned about you that I did not know about you in uh, going through this book. What's that, Paul? That you went to school with Scott Kahn's cousin. I did. That's my claim to fame. (laughs) Yes. And, God, I was jealous the day that she brought the kids in the kitchen. I think it was changing. No, or Bitter Desire poster anyway. I can remember the poster as black and I put it in the book. 
Um, I so wanted that poster. You have no idea. And I remember she was she was looking at the poster and she's going, what does seven um, two dots and 12 two dots mean? And I was like, seven inch and 12 inch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. Those were the days. We will leave on a question. Which church hit features a backward bagpipe solo? Jane Gazzo. Pardon me. Under the Milky Way. <laughs> so anyone watching this interview now, sorry, we've we just, you know, we should have put a spoiler alert up. We've given away one of the quiz questions at the end. <laughs> The, uh, the book is I Hear Motion, Jane Gazzo, the author. Jane, good to see you. Thanks for being here at Noise 11. Thank you, Paul.